I want to open up this message with a question. I want you to be really honest with yourself when I ask you this question. But when you hear somebody make a statement to you, he or she has a call of God on their life. Where does your mind go? I'm going to tell you where most of the Western church goes, their mind goes, when they hear that question. They think, oh, that man, that woman is called to be a pastor, stand on a platform and preach and teach, called to be a worship leader, maybe go to the mission field. And it's always in regard to full-time pulpit or worship ministry. Well, I want to challenge that. You know, we read in the scripture, Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10. This is a scripture that every one of you is familiar with. We all have memorized probably this scripture, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Now, Almost every Christian knows that scripture, but why is it we always leave off verse 10 when we're quoting this portion of scripture? Because verse 10 starts out with the word for. For means because of this. It is a conjunction, which means the thought process is not through. For you, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this, to do. Everybody say that with me, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So you know what that tells me? We all have a call of God on our life. Every single one of us, no matter what sphere of life, no matter what sphere of vocation that we go into, there is a calling on our life. And God has given us gifts to accompany that calling so that we can manifest that calling in our life. Let me give you a little story that happened to me a few years back. It was about six, seven years ago. I was in Los Angeles. I was going to speak on a Sunday morning at the Los Angeles Dream Center. One of our partners, everybody in the United States, I think, that plays golf, that is a partner of ours, knows John Bevere loves to play golf. Well, he called me and said, hey, would you like to play Riviera, which is one of the most famous golf courses in Southern California? I said, absolutely. He picked me up Saturday morning. We went and played, had a great time. We were on our way back to the hotel, and his name, Stan, made a statement to me. He said, John, I, I, I just really want to open up and kind of bare my heart to you. I said, sure, Stan, what's up? He said, you know, John, I have worked tirelessly for all these years to build up my businesses. And my businesses are probably worth about $9 million. He said, to be really honest with you, my wife is cared for for the rest of her life. My children are cared for for the rest of their life. He said, here I am now entering the decade of the 50s. Why should I work as hard as I have worked up to this time to build my businesses up to $35 million? Why not just take it more easy because my wife and children are cared for. Well, I immediately looked inside and I said, Holy Spirit, you got to give me an answer for this one. I said, you know, I have written, and at that time, seven years ago, it was 17 books. It's now 22 books. I said, I've written 17 books. I have gotten on airplanes. I've flown about 12 million miles all over the world, every continent except Antarctica. I have fought jet lag. I have eaten, uh, foreign strange foods to me. I have, you know, stood on platforms, worked tirelessly. Uh, writing the books takes hours and hours and hours. You know what? I'm cared for. My wife's cared for. My children are cared for. Why should I write another book? Why should I get on another airplane and fight jet lag and different cultures in order to continue to preach? And Stan laughed. He actually laughed at me. And this is what he said with a smirk on his face. He said, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes when you face Jesus. And I said, Stan, you just said the exact same thing to me. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. His little smirk came off his face. We're in downtown Los Angeles. He turns to me and he goes, what are you talking about? I said, Stan, here's the deal. Both you and I have a call of God on our life, and we have gifts to accomplish that call. My gifts happen to be writing and preaching. Your gifts is making money and giving into the kingdom. I said, Stan, I am using my gifts to build the kingdom. 
The, the problem is you have not connected the dots. You have not realized the magnitude of the call of God upon your life. And he just, he, he was speechless. And I said, Stan, every one of us have been given gifts and we can do one of three things with gifts. We can use the gifts for ourselves to build ourselves and our family. We can use the gifts to build the kingdom or we can leave the gifts dormant and not use them at all. And I said, you have not connected the dots. And I remember six months later, he called me up and he said, uh, hey, John, how you doing? I said, well, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? He said, can I be really honest with you? I said, sure. He said, I have been haunted in a good way every day for the last six months by the words you spoke to me. I said, well, what are you doing about it? He said, I'm busting my rear end to build my businesses up to 35 million so I can give more to the kingdom of God and build the kingdom of God in a greater capacity. So this is the situation. Every one of you that I'm talking to right now, you have gifts that God has placed in your life. I want to talk to you about those gifts today. Now, first of all, Romans chapter 12, verse 6 speaks specifically to this. Paul makes a statement. He said, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Now, there's three words that I want to highlight at the beginning of this message that are going to be very important and very key to what we're talking about. The first word I want to highlight is the word grace. All right, let's read that scripture again. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. The word grace there is the Greek word charis. When you say grace to the average Christian. This is what they think. And the reason I know this is we did a national poll all across the United States. Over 5,000 Christians were polled. And we asked them, what is the first thing you think about? What is your definition of the grace of God? The top four answers were forgiveness, <clears throat> it was salvation, it was a free gift, and the love of God. Only two, and this is the tragedy of the survey, only 2% of those over 5,000 Christians said that the grace of God is God's empowerment. Yet this is exactly what God says to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. God says, my grace, now listen to these words, my grace is sufficient for you for my power works best in your weakness or your human inability. So God right there identifies his grace as his power. If you look at 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter makes a statement, grace be multiplied to you as his divine power has given to us everything we need to live a godly life. Peter directly attributes the grace of God to being his divine power. If you look at the Greek word charis, Strong's defines this word as gift, favor, benefit, gracious, liberality. However, Strong's goes on to describe this word as the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. So there's an outward reflection of what's done in the heart. That's the empowerment of grace. Remember in Acts chapter 11, when Barnabas went to the churches in Antioch, he saw the grace of God that was on the people. He didn't hear about it. He saw the divine empowerment that was being reflected in their life. So when you hear grace, don't just think forgiveness of sins, salvation. That's 100% accurate, but don't limit the definition. It is God's empowerment, listen to my definition, that gives us the ability to go beyond our natural ability. Write that down. It is God's divine empowerment upon our lives that gives us the ability to go beyond our natural ability. Let me tell you something about the call of God on your life. The call of God on your life you can never, ever, 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 ever accomplish it in your own ability. <laughs> yeah, God made the calling that he placed on your life beyond your natural ability. You want to know why I know that? Because if God made it, let's say it this way. If God made you able to fulfill the call that he placed upon your life in your own ability, then he'd have to share the glory with you. And God said, I'm not sharing my glory with anybody. So that means that God made your call calling beyond your natural ability so you would have to depend on grace to fulfill it. Oh man, that one makes me really excited. This is why it is so important you understand what I'm saying to you. Now, having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Now I want to focus in on the word gifts. 
If you take the Greek word charis and you put an M and an A on it, you get charisma. What is charisma? It is a specific gift of grace that empowers an individual to fulfill what they have been created to do. One of the charismas on my life is writing. Okay, now a lot of you don't know this, but one of my worst subjects in high school was English and creative writing. <laughs> yes, I'm not kidding. We actually have a national entrance exam that gets us into college, university, and one of the major sections of that uh, exam is English or verbal, and I scored a 370 out of 800. Now, let me tell you how bad that is. First of all, that's below 50%. Secondly, in all my travels across the United States, I have only met one individual who scored lower than me in the English and the creative writing and the comprehension on the SAT. So you can see I was horrific at writing. I mean, it would take me four hours to write a two-page paper. So in 1991, when God spoke to me, it was the summer of 91. I remember I was outside. It was early in the morning. I was praying. God said, son, I want you to write. I kind of laughed. I said, God, I think that you have so many of us kids now on this planet that you're getting us mixed up with one another. You don't want me writing. <laughs> and, you know, uh, there was nothing, no response from the Lord, nothing. And, and I said, God, you just, I mean, talk to my English teachers. And I did nothing for 10 months. And 10 months later, two women came to me from two different states in the United States within two weeks of each other. And they both said the exact same words to me. They said, John Bevere, if you don't write what God's giving you to write, he'll give the message to somebody else. And one day you'll stand in judgment for it. And when the second woman said it from the state of Texas, two weeks after the first woman from Florida, the fear of God hit me. And I remember I took a notebook piece of paper and I wrote on that notebook piece of paper on top, I said, contract. And I wrote a contract with God. I said, God, I think you're making a huge mistake. You have many, many writers in the body of Christ that are much better than me. So if I'm going to write, I need grace. And I remember I signed the contract. And now the books are in the tens of millions. They're in over 120 languages all over the world. They are international bestsellers. And you know what? Nobody knows more than me. The reason my name's on that book is I was just the first guy to get to read it. It was the gift of God on my life that caused this book to come forth. Another gift on my life is speaking publicly. You know, the first time that I spoke after Lisa and I was mar were married, she was sitting on the front row. Five minutes into my message, she was sound asleep. She was in such deep sleep that I watched drool coming out of the side of her best friend's mouth right beside her. Okay, so they slept through my whole message. Now I speak in front of tens of thousands of people. I don't get nervous. Why? Because of the gift of God that came on my life. Now, one of the gifts that is not on my life is singing. Every time I try to sing or worship in my house out loud, my family politely but firmly says, quiet, John, sing to yourself or go outside and sing alone. Let me tell you something, you would not want me leading worship, okay? So you just need to understand that. There are gifts that God has placed on our life. Now, I'm going to go to the third word. In order to do that, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul makes this statement, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ. Now listen to what he says, and stewards. Now, this word stewards is an amazing word. What is a steward? A steward is one who who is a manager of somebody else's property or affairs. So a steward doesn't own what he manages. He actually manages something that belongs to somebody else. So what are we stewards of? Hey, you guessed it. Charisma, the gift of God upon our life. That gift of writing on my life is not my ability. It's actually God's ability. Therefore, I manage what God has entrusted me with. So think about it. If you had a car and you, you gave me that car and you said, I want you to take care of it. If I never brought it to the shop, never got the oil changed, never got the car serviced and your car broke down, you would come back to me and say, I don't understand why my car broke down. Did you, did you service it? And I, I would have to say, no, I didn't. You wouldn't be very happy with me because I wasn't a good steward of what belongs to you. So God doesn't micromanage us. I want you to understand that. 
A steward is not micromanaged. If you'll remember, Joseph is a classic example of a steward in the Bible. Potiphar was so confident with Joseph, he made him a steward of his whole household. And Potiphar didn't even know what was happening in his house except for the food that was before him at his dinner table. That's how much he committed and trusted the caring of his household, the finances, everything, the administration of his household to Joseph. Joseph was a steward. So we, you and I, are stewards of these gifts that God's placed on my life, on your life. So if, you're, if yours is singing, if yours is giving, you are a steward of that gift. Now, I want to go to a scripture that pulls all three of these words together, and that is 1 Peter chapter 4. And I'm going to tell you stories when I get to the end of this, but I just want to really lay a foundation scripturally of what I'm talking about. 1 Peter chapter 4.10 says this, as each one has received a gift, the word gift is charisma. Now, notice Peter doesn't say as each pastor has received a gift. As each minister, fivefold minister, has received a gift. If you're born again and you have the Spirit of God living in you, you have a gift. What is that gift for? You have a gift or gifts. Those gifts are given to you to help you accomplish what you are called to do. Listen to what Peter says. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. So he says, hey, don't sit on it. Use it. Remember Paul says, having gifts differing according to the grace of God, let us use them. God didn't give you the gift for you to sit on it, okay? As good stewards, there is the word stewards, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So what he's saying is, manifold means there are so many aspects, so many different aspects of God's giftings. So Paul compares it to the human body. And this will be a great example. If you look at my body, I have many different members, right? And each member has different abilities or gifts. If, in other words, my fingers can do things that my nose can't do. My nose can do things that my toes can't do. My toes can do things that my heart can't do. My heart can do things that my liver can't do. My liver can do things that my elbow can't do. My elbow can do things that my hands can't do. I could go on and on and on. And let me say this. Happy is the man or woman who knows their gift and operates in it. Miserable is the man or woman who tries to operate in somebody else's gift. <laughs> Wouldn't it be really weird if today when my guys came over to, to, to videotape this for this conference, this service, what if, what if my thumb would have got up this morning and said, hey, mouth, I've had it. You've been preaching now for 30 years. I'm going to speak to the conference today. I mean, that's ridiculous. My, 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 my little thumb, my, my camera guys are kind of laughing right now. My thumb does not have the ability to speak. That's why I said happy is the man or woman who knows their gifts and operates in them. And so miserable is the man or woman who tries to operate in somebody else's gift. So we are stewards of what? The gifts that God has entrusted to us. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1 and 2. Paul said, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. Now look what he says in verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards. Oh, wow. Here we go. Required. Required in stewards. What's the requirement of a steward? That one be found faithful. So the only requirement God places upon the steward that he makes it crystal clear. I mean, there's other, believe me, there's other things he's looking for, but this is the one that he really zeroes in on that is so important is that you're found faithful. Faithful in stewarding the gifts of God on your life. Now, I have spoken to leadership teams all over the world and I've asked them to give me definitions of faithful and I I can't do this right now because you can't respond to me, but I got a list. I got a list right here of the top definitions that I have received from leadership teams. And I'm talking about ministry leadership teams. I've talked to education, to business, to sports. I have talked to so many different leadership teams. So what is your definition of faithful? Steadfast, consistent, dependable, reliable. I'm sure you've thought of all these words. Loyal, true, trustworthy. Devoted and truthful. Those are the top answers I've received all over the world when I say, what's the definition of faithful? Do you know the one definition I have never, ever received once unless somebody heard me preach this? Never heard this, not once. And it's one of the most important definitions of faithful. And that is this, multiplication. You say, whoa, 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 John, whoa, whoa. Multiplication? That's not a definition of faithful. 
Oh, yes, it is. Let me tell you about this parable. You remember the parable of the talents found in Matthew chapter 25 and the parable of the minus found in Luke 19. Let's look at Matthew 25. We've got this situation where Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like this. He's he is like a very wealthy man calls his servants, his servants, not outsiders, his servants. And what does he do? He's going to travel. He's going to take a long trip and he delivers his goods to them. Stewardship. And to one, he gave five talents. Now, a talent is actually a measure of weight. This is actually something that is, in this parable, it's financial. So, it was the weight of gold or silver. And most people believe that this was the weight of silver. And one talent of silver was about 18 pounds. That would be around nine kilograms of silver. So, it's a pretty hefty bag a pretty hefty amount that this owner entrusts to each of these servants. To one, he gave five bags of silver, five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And immediately, he went on a journey. Now, I'm going to try to make this real personal, okay? So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to scribe names to these guys because this will make it more real to you, okay? So, we're going to say that Ashley got five talents. We're going to say that Bob got two talents. And we're going to say Larry, and if your name's Larry, no offense, Larry got one talent, all right? Now, what happens? Then Ashley, who had received the five talents, went and traded with them and made another five talents. So, she multiplied. And likewise, Dave, who had received two, gained two more also. He multiplied. But Larry, who had received one, went and dug it in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Ashley starts out with five. She multiplies and ends up with ten. Dave starts out with two. He multiplies, ends up with four. Larry maintains what is given to him. He starts out with one and ends up with one. Now, watch what happened. After a long time, the Lord of these servants came and settled accounts with them. So Ashley, who had received five talents, came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents beside this. Listen to what the Lord, this is representative of Jesus. Her Lord said to her, well done, good and faithful servant. Now listen to this. You were faithful. Wait a minute. What's the only thing Jesus ascribes to her doing. He doesn't say that she was sweet, she was kind, she was forgiving. He doesn't say she was dependable, reliable, trustworthy. He doesn't say any of that. He just said she multiplied. That's all he said. Five to ten. And he said, you were faithful. So he is directly ascribing faithful with multiplication. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler into many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then Dave, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more. Beside them, his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful. You were faithful. What's the only thing he did? Multiply. That's the only thing the parable tells us. Over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Notice the wording is exact for both Dave and Ashley. They got equal reward. God's not going to sit there and say, well... You got 10, therefore you're the better servant. No, he's looking at what we did with what he gave us. That's why you can never compare yourself with somebody else. It's not wise. Then Larry, who had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew you be I knew you to be a hard man. Problem number one, he doesn't understand the character of his master. Okay, he saw him as a hard man. Instead of the loving father who wants us to be our, at our very best for the sake of the kingdom, he sees him as a harsh man mean Lord, okay? Reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid. Problem number two, fear. Intimidation fear causes the gift of God in your life to go dormant. I wrote an entire book on it, and if you need help in that area, I recommend the book Breaking Intimidation. He said, I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours, but his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Oh my goodness. Wow. No, he doesn't say you wicked and lazy outsider. This guy is in his kingdom. Now, let's just talk about our callings and our giftings. We're not talking about salvation here. We're not talking about anything other than how we handle our gifts. What this parable shows is those who multiply are considered to be faithful. Those who maintain are looked at as wicked and lazy. 
Now that may have really shocked you. You may have thought, boy, I'm, I'm being faithful. I show up on time. I'm, I'm, I'm dependable. That's an aspect of faithfulness, but that's not the faithfulness that God's looking for. He's looking for you to multiply. What's the first commandment that God made to man when he put him on the earth? Be fruitful and multiply. He wasn't just saying have babies, okay? He was saying anything I entrust to you, return it back to me multiplied. Wow. That's all I can say is wow. So let's move on here. The master says, so take the talent from Larry and give it to Ashley, who has 10 talents. Let's make sure you understand this. I'm going to put it down at the bottom of the screen. Larry ends up with zero. Ashley ends up with 11. 10 plus 1 is 11. Now, I'm in prayer one morning. I'm in my office. I hadn't read this parable in years, or, not, or in months, excuse me. Out of the blue, the Holy Spirit speaks to me, and he said, Son, I am not socialistic in the way I think. You remember God said, my thoughts aren't your thoughts, right? He said, I'm not socialistic in the way I think. I'm actually more capitalistic. And I remember saying, okay, God, you, you're going to have to show this to me from the scripture. And he brought me to this parable. Social, the socialistic God would do this. He would give all three of them, Ashley, Dave, and Larry, okay? He would give all three, three talents each. Okay, so Ashley and Dave, of course, they're going to be faithful. So what are they going to do? They're going to multiply their three and end up with six. Larry, he's going to be lazy. He's going to end up with three, right? This is what the socialistic God would have done. He would have taken one from Ashley, six, one from Dave, six, and given them to Larry. So they all ended up with five. That is not what God did. He took the one from Larry and gave it to Ashley. So she had 11 and he had zero. Folks, let me tell you something. God has given you gifts, and he expects you to return it back to him multiplied. Now, this is not meant to put a lot of pressure on you. It's meant for you to get in faith, because you can't multiply unless you are in faith. Jesus then says this, and this is a very riveting statement. For to everyone who has, in regard to this parable, who are the ones that have? It's the two that multiplied. For everyone who has, more will be given, and he or she will have an abundance. That's what happened with Ashley. But from him who does not have, maintains, even what he has will be taken away. This is why it's so important for you to understand you have a call in your life. If you don't realize you have a call in your life, you won't be passionate. You, you know, you look at Billy Graham. Let's talk about Billy Graham. He went home to be with Jesus, got a great reward, I believe, in his 99th year uh, on this earth. That man was passionate. You, you look at your pastors and you think, oh, they're so passionate. You should be equally passionate. There was a businessman that I was asked to meet with last year. He is a multi-billionaire and he was doing his God tour. What he does is he flies his private jet, his Gulfstream 550 around the United States and meets with different pastors so that they can speak into his life. Well, I thought, I'm going to speak into this guy's life. Well, I didn't realize that God was going to use him to really minister to me because I asked him, I said, what's your story? He said, well, you know, I was a floundering businessman. I was doing everything in the business world the way everybody else was. And he said, one day I'm watching my pastor and I realized my pastor has a call in his life and he depends on the Holy Spirit to fulfill that calling. And he said, I'm sitting in that church as a floundering businessman thinking, wait a minute, I have a call on my life to be a businessman, to be a giver in the kingdom. Why aren't I depending on the Holy Spirit like he does? Why am I doing it the way the world does it? See, to him, there was the sacred church, there was the secular, which was the marketplace. He realized, wait a minute, there's not the sacred and the secular. It's all sacred because the call of my life is sacred. So he said, John, I started getting up every morning, get my notepad out, and I'd start writing down what the Holy Spirit said to do. He started telling me to do some wild things. They were unconventional, totally contrary to the business world. He said, but John, he said, I now am a multi-billionaire. I, I, I own 20 hospitals in Vietnam. I own the second largest bank in the world. I am coming up with jet engines right now that fly off of battery power, not gas. I mean, the guy was amazing. I was mesmerized. And I realized Jesus saying, make disciples of the nations. Nations is a group of people with a common denominator, a common interest, a common bond. Yes, 
Malaysia is a nation. Yes, Cambodia is a nation. Yes, Iran is a nation. Yes, the United States is a nation. But I believe that the marketplace is a nation. Jesus is making disciples of the nations. He doesn't say even the people. Look at Zacchaeus. He has one encounter with Jesus. He's a tax collector. He's operating under darkness, but he's swindling people. He's taking more than what's due to him. He has one encounter with Jesus. He said, anybody I've robbed from, which was probably quite a few, I'll give them back 400% and I'll give half my goods to the poor. What happened to the rest of the tax collectors of that region? Because he was the number one guy in the whole region. The whole probably region started operating according to kingdom principles. I've been to nations. They won't let me leave until I slip $20 US bill under the counter to the guy that's stamping my, you know, my passport. Why is that? Because the, 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 the leader of the nation expects his officers under him to slip them money and it keeps going down. It's an operation of darkness. But you know, when, when you begin to bring kingdom principles to your nation, so let's say you're a pilot to the nation of pilots, or you're a bodybuilder to the nation of bodybuilders, what's going to happen? You're going to get people getting saved because they're going to see the difference. What happens when we begin to operate in kingdom principles? You know, I have a friend, his gift on his life's not writing like me. His gift is giving. And he got saved when he was 11 years old. And when he, when he was 36 years old, he got fed up with being a, what he called nominal Christian. He wasn't accomplishing anything for the kingdom. So he said, this is what I did, John. I memorized 2,000 scriptures in the next six months. So here he is, 36 years old, and he memorized 36, uh, two, over 2,000 scriptures. He had only memorized two scriptures before that. So he got the wisdom of God in his life. So then he went to a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, six months later, and he was so broke, so poor, that he was staying in an apartment complex. Listen to this, guys. An apartment complex with 11 other students, all right, who went to that big church. And the pastor of that big church said, hey, I want you to just pray and find out what does God want you to give in this conference? He prayed and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I want you to give $200. His response was, Lord, that's all I have. And the Holy Spirit said back to him, I'm not asking you for any more. So he gave everything he had in his wallet in that offering. God started giving him some ideas. He said, God, what do you want me to do now? God said, I want you to give $100 a month above your tithe. He started giving $100 above his month. It went to $200, it went to $400, went to $1,000, went to $3,500, it went to $5,000 a month over his tithe. Then it went to 10,000. Then it went to 25,000. Then it went to 35,000. Then it went to 50,000. Then it went to 100,000. And then it went to $150,000 a month above his tithe. That's where he is now. He lives on 10 to 15% of his income. He gives away 85 to 90% of what he makes and he lives pretty well. What am I saying? He tapped into multiplication. He got the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God led him to multiply, and he start, started doing it. You know, I had become an, a bestseller in the United States. We had a curriculum in which churches were using that went along with our books. You all know about the Beta Satan book. I made a curriculum. I did 12 30-minute lessons, walked right through the book. Churches were using it all over the United States, 25, over 25,000 churches. One day I'm in my ba basement. This was 10 years ago. I'm reading the book of Daniel, and the Holy Spirit filled the entire basement. And he said, son, and this is where this message came from. He said, you have been faithful with the English-speaking community. We had been, I, I'd been a best-selling author over 25,000 churches using these curriculums that our ministry developed. You've been faithful in the English-speaking community. I now want you to get your books into the hands of every pastor and every leader in the world who cannot afford them. I had no idea what God was saying, but I remember that first year, I stretched our team and it took a big stretch. I mean, when I made the announcement that we were gonna give 250,000 books away, my wife said she tasted throw up in her mouth. But that year we gave away, that first year in 2011, we gave away 271,700 books to pastors and leaders in 46 nations. 
And it was such an exciting thing to see happen. But do you know what happened the next year? We did 1.3 million. And the next year, 2.6 million. Now we're averaging six to eight million a year. So now in just 10 years, by the grace of God, we have been able to give away over 40 million resources to pastors and leaders in 226 nations in 111 languages. We are only 30 nations short of the entire world. Yes, we are going to accomplish by the grace of God what he told us to do. Why did God tell me to do that in that basement 10 years ago? Because I had been faithful to multiply the Beta Satan book in curriculums, getting it into the churches, by the grace of God. And so God said to him who has, more will be given. And so here's the thing you want to remember. The first thing you got to do, Jesus said, if you're not faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you your own? First thing you got to understand, I worked for two churches, two senior pastors. One had a staff of 450 employees. The other one had a staff of 150. I multiplied I multiplied in that position of youth pastor, in that position of executive assistant to the pastor. I had two positions for seven years in the local church. I multiplied everywhere they put me. And then I began to multiply when I start when God, when my pastor launched us in to Messenger International. Lisa and I together, we multiplied, we multiplied, we multiplied. This is what we are called to do. I am 61 years old and I have news for you. I'm not done multiplying. Why? As long as there's the grace of God in my life, as long as the gift of God is on my life, I'm not retiring. I'm going to keep multiplying because I want to see Jesus glorified in this earth. And I know that the only the only way people are going to see Jesus, the only way they're going to hear his words is when his church begins to multiply what God has entrusted to us. I know you're excited right now. I know you're sitting on the edge of your seats. I know that you want to see the kingdom of God manifested in your world of influence. So this is what I want to do. I want to pray for you. I want to believe God. He said, come boldly to the throne of grace. Why? To obtain grace in a time of need. It's a time of need. There are people in your world of influence that are not saved yet. They have not heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ yet. But you know what? In your multiplication, whether you're in the medical field, education, government, athletics, no matter where you're at, the kingdom of God is going to manifest and it's going to multiply because of your obedience. So Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters that are watching right now. And Lord, I'm asking that an anointing and a mantle would come upon their life to multiply the gift of God that is upon their lives. I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that, Lord, whatever gift you placed upon their life, that that gift would be stirred up, come alive, and multiply in their world of influence. And I ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, let me say this. If you are not in relationship with God, I want to pray for you. You know, you can never really successfully do what I have preached to you about unless you have a relationship with your Creator. The Bible makes this very clear. The only way to have a relationship with God is to enter into a covenant with Jesus Christ. Let me make this really clear. The Bible says that Jesus is the groom and that we are His bride. Now, God gave us an illustrated sermon that we see every day, and that is a, a relationship between a husband and a wife. Jesus is the husband, we're like the wife. When a bride walks down an aisle of a church, she is actually making a pretty strong statement. She's saying goodbye to 3.9 billion guys. You know what she's saying? This is the one and only man I'm going to give the rest of my life to. When we come to Jesus Christ, he paid the price and freed us from our sins so that we can enter back into a relationship with God. However, the only way you can ever have a relationship with Jesus is not just praying some formula prayer. It is when you say, I give my entire life to you the way a bride gives her entire life to her husband. She's not going to flirt with guys anymore, give guys their numbers, jump in bed with other guys. I am completely dedicated to this husband. That's the only way you can enter into a relationship with God Almighty. And if you say, John, I'm ready to do it, then I want you to repent right now. What does repent mean? I'm going to change the way I live. I've lived for myself. I am now going to live for Jesus Christ, who is my groom. So let's pray this prayer together, and I want you to mean it. Say these words out loud. Say this, God in heaven. Forgive me for living life my way. I'm not doing that anymore. Today it's all changing. 
from this moment forward for the rest of my life, I give my spirit, soul, body, everything I am, everything I own to you, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you are now my Lord, Master, and Savior. My life is forever yours. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you have become, and you meant it from your heart, you have become a child of God. And you are now my brother, or you are now my sister. And you are now a princess of the king of the universe. And you are now a prince of the universe, of the king of the universe. I am so happy for you. It has been a pleasure and honor. Remember the book X, it's a big X, multiply your God-given potential. You can get it wherever books are sold. I love you guys so very much, and God bless you.